Hello, welcome everybody. You're going to find the handouts in the chat. Awesome. Welcome, welcome in everyone. Apologies for our slight delay in getting started. We know technology, it's fun. Um, but thank you for being here. We're going to go ahead and get things started. You just to make sure you're in the right place. This is the Reading League, Louisiana, and we are so excited to bring this session to you today, supporting Louisiana schools literacy plans, elementary intervention structures. So just to give you an overview of the mission of the Reading League, we can advance to the next. The Reading League is here to service and support those across our state, particularly, but all who join us. And as a matter of fact, go ahead and use this time to drop in the chat who you are and where you're joining us from. So we know we don't always have Louisiana only folks. So if you're in Louisiana, let us know where you're visiting us from. Um, if you are one of our uh, non-Louisiana neighbors, please let us know. And again, thank you for being here. But the Reading League's mission is to advance the awareness, understanding, and use of evidence-aligned reading instruction. And that is why we're here today. And we also have, and I just want to acknowledge some of our um, Reading League Louisiana board members. I serve as president, and I know Susan's on here. Susan Connick is our vice president. We may have some other representatives from um, the Reading League Louisiana, which is sponsored by the Center for Literacy and Learning. So again, thank you for being here. The goal or your objectives throughout this um, presentation is to identify and discuss those instructional practices that are meeting the needs of all learners, and also to plan or revise those literacy plans both at the district level and at the school level. So hopefully you can take away uh, from today uh, and apply those things that you learned to your plans. Speaking of your literacy plans, I know you all have already done that. Those are hopefully reviewed by you um, annually to see if you need to make any adjustments. But we have developed uh, or trying to develop this series of um, systems of supports for you to apply to your literacy plan. And if you look at the literacy pillars that exist, our focus today is gonna to be on that explicit literacy intervention and extension portion of your literacy plan. So to give you an overview of what that section looks like, here's a little helpful graphic. I'm not gonna read through it, but this is what it means to dive into that explicit instruction, intervention and extension section. So please, if you have not seen this already, dive into it, get familiar with it, adjust, adapt, modify, and implement. So hopefully you all have been um, working through that. Now to get with our MTSS, so while we are here, and again, we're developing this series of MTSS um, uh, sessions for you. So today we're gonna to look at the um, MTSS, but really have you look at the difference between RTI and MTSS structures and intervention, because lots of times those are used interchangeably. And so we don't want to um, confuse the two and really distinguish the difference in the two. And when you're looking at RTI process versus the MTSS process, we really look at what that um, entails and what it includes, the academic assessments and instruction and intervention versus a, a true framework that whatever those um, interventions are necessary or those areas that you need to um, focus on, that they can be applied to an MTS as a true multi-tiered system of support versus the response to the intervention that's being applied. So the next is looking at the district's role in that MTSS process. The official Is there an official process in place, the adequate curricular pieces, and then making sure that the supports are available as well. And as you can see, there are some subsets to each of those. And then you have the teacher's role in an MTSS uh, process, which is what they understand and how we're instructing. And then again, what 
resources are available to support implementation. Y'all, we will always go back to resources and support for implementation. So I ran through those because you're not here to listen to me. <laughs> we are here to welcome our presenters for today. They are coming to us from West Feliciana, and uh, we are so excited that they are here to share what they are doing um, in their district around um, MTSS and RTI. And so we have Jody, and Jody is Jody Lemoyne. I'm Correct. Say, I didn't practice this before, guys. Who's <laughs> the director of accountability? And then Tanya Holiday from Baines Lower School, who's the assistant principal. And so just to give you a little overview, Jody is, like I said, the director of accountability, and she has 21 years of experience in middle as a middle school teacher, instructional coach, and former principal at Baines Elementary. Her focus now is on the success of curriculum, instruction, and assessment at all schools within the parish. And then Tanya is a former kindergarten teacher and instructional coach at Baines Lower. And she now serves as Baines Lower's assistant principal with a focus on curriculum and instruction for early childhood learning. That's our, woo -woo, that's our, that's our people. Uh, she advises the West Feliciana Head Start program through professional development and leading professional learning communities for those teachers as well. So she's been a part of leading Baines Lower through several curriculum changes, like yeah, I know y'all feel that pain, and has coached teachers leading uh, to improved reading performance for our students. So without further ado, again, thank you guys so much for being here and we're gonna turn it over to you all to enlighten us on all the things that are happening. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, it is it is our pleasure uh, to be here and be with you today. Um, we are just so excited to be able, uh, anytime that we're asked or given the opportunity to share um, what the incredible work and things that both the teachers and the students um, in our parish are doing, that is a true honor for us. And um, as you can tell from uh, the work, the focus that uh, Miss Holiday Tanya does. Um, I go nowhere where I'm expected to speak on early childhood where I don't make sure she is with me. Um, she is my go-to expert. And so um, she will she will bring so much uh, a wealth of knowledge to you as well. So so we've basically been asked um, and, and we've uh, provided this in several different settings across the state, but we've been asked um, to kind of share what was sort of our nuts and bolts planning um, that went to into our intentionally planning for early childhood literacy instruction and intervention, um, and, and especially in response to school loss in terms of COVID. So everything that we're going to uh, share with you today, our planning really began in the, the summer of that 21-22 school year, when we were all sort of returning to school uh, or to what school would look like from then on. And so that is sort of the timeline that you that you will be looking at. Um, so here you see some of our uh, district information. We are a small rural uh, parish in Louisiana. We are small in population, but very large geographically. So um, we have about 2,200 kids that we serve. Um, we have a very high uh, students that we serve with exceptionality. So about 25% um, are students with exceptionalities about 17% uh, are students with a uh, um, students with a disability or students that struggle. We do not have a large ELL population, as you can see. Um, a lot of our work, though, is done um, with students who have reading deficits or learning deficits, um, and and we kind of have a ro robust program. Baines Lower does a good job at sort of. Um, highlighting these kids and making sure we put things in place to sort of to sort of catch kids and catch them up so that they don't move forward um, and need special ed services. So being a, a small district, we have wisely through the years of our leadership, um, we've we've managed to keep one of every campus. Um, and the result of that is there are no that school or this school. All of our kids come together. So we have Baines Lower Elementary, which really serves as an early learning center. Um, if you can, in Baines Lower, we have universal pre-K. That's been in place now in Wesley Shanna Parish for probably 30 years. 
And in terms of early childhood learning, that's where we first started moving the dial. Um, so any child in our district, there is no lottery, there is no registration according to needs. Any student who resides in our parish can attend uh, pre-K with free of charge. Um, and Baneslower goes through kindergarten. So our Head Start, early Head Start is also housed in that building. So though Ms. Holiday does not work directly with Head Start because they share that building, she is able to provide that professional development and that curriculum and instruction guide, even for our Head Start um, students. Then all of our students move to our Baines campus where we serve first through fifth grade. Then we have a traditional middle school and a traditional high school, and that's the, the breakdown of what we what we offer. If you will go back one more slide um, to paint, there we go. So our intervention structures look a little like this, um, and I'm actually going to turn over to Tanya and let Tanya speak to you on Baines Lowers model. Okay, so for Baines Lowers model, um, we have the 90-minute uh, ELA block with the push-in person. And the push-in person could be um, a certified teacher as well. It, it could be anyone uh, from the librarian to a support teacher, a sped teacher. It could also be um, a para, the place 60 or PE teacher. We train all of them in um, working with kids with small groups and meeting the needs, whatever need it is that they have. Uh, and so when you walk into that classroom, you would see uh, two small groups operating at the same time, meeting the needs of the kids. And then with those uh, two groups going on at the same time, we also have the kids in small group literacy stations that are based on the five components of reading. And so we uh, make sure that we're reinforcing those skills daily and we're giving the kids an opportunity to learn with support, but then also be able to work independently as well. And then also uh, for our tier two, that's our win time, which is usually in the afternoon. We also have push in people come in for that. And um, what they do is provide support just like the 90 minute block. Uh, so again, you would see two groups going, going on at the same time, providing them support and then also allowing the kids uh, to work in small group or work on the computer to uh, work, work on intervention, on a literacy-based intervention program that's computerized. And then the intensive tier three is where we have, we actually have four reading interventionists that provide support to the uh, students uh, that need it, that desperately need it. And that's in addition, our intervention team is so rock solid until they, you know, they work with our kindergarten teachers, but they also work with the pre-K teachers to ensure that our kids are kindergarten ready. So that is, um, and I am, uh, Jennifer is watching questions for me. So we are getting, uh, kind of logging these questions and we will address them. One thing that I wanna make sure that I highlight uh, that Tanya said is we train everyone. So mm -hmm. one of the decisions that was made at a district level for our district is when we got the influx of the ESSER dollars, and there was a lot of conversation about what do you do with this money? What programs do we buy? What, what computer software licensings or things like that should we be putting in? We actually decided the best thing we have in our building are our people, our teachers. And so we created, and we've had three years worth of additional reading and, and math, but our focus for today, reading interventionist. Um, and so we increase the number of students who could be seen at a tier two and a tier three level. We we nearly tripled that number of students. Um, so Baines Lower received two additional interventionists to what they already had. So they're now currently working in a, in a model where two interventionists can focus entirely on pre-K and two interventionists can focus entirely on kinder. Then at Baines, they received two additional intervention um, intervention student uh, per people, and through that, they were able to increase and have five reading interventionists. And not to say that our older kids don't matter, 
but we know that if it if we don't catch and support these kids early, then we will really truly never make up that ground. So those five interventionists focused entirely on first, second, and third grade, and we use other programs and models once we hit fourth grade. So we dedicated our dollars to, we said it's going to take people mm -hmm. catching children up, knowledgeable teachers who know what to do. And then, like Tanya said, we train everybody. So mm -hmm. it's a cost to the district, but it really, it's so, it more than gives, gives you back on, on your investment. When we are having a, um, a training, when someone comes in to do any kind of training, paras are included. Um, currently the science of reading training, uh, that that's mandated by the state, we've had paras seek out or go to Miss Holiday or go to their principals and say, can, can I do this too? Can I get it? And to my not to date at the district level, we have said that's absolutely worth the cost that it would take. Yes, we'll buy one more license. We'll buy one more thing for those teachers. Um, we've had teachers who've been able to say, look, I can put what I've learned and, and do a train the trainer of sorts. And they share with their uh, with the paras or other people. But we teach everyone because if you're an adult in the building, you're a teacher. Um, Tanya, to. has a, Tanya has an anecdote that she tells, and I love, it's one of my favorites. Tanya, you have to tell them about uh, the difference between jelly and jam, because that to yes. me is, that one's so valuable and it describes what happens in your school perfectly. Yes, we're, um, you know, we're constantly teaching the children new vocabulary and we um, had been having, we had a data team meeting and we were focusing on our ELA uh, scores. And we remembered from previous years that we would always have children that were struggling with particular words. And so we came up with um, various strategies to be able to, uh, you know, handle it, to work on it, to front load before we would have those issues on the back end. And one of the words I remember we were, um, the children would get cold reads and, you know, they couldn't necessarily, because we have the littles, we read the story to them and we'll read it to them once or twice, well, actually twice. Um, and then they'll have to be able to um, answer the questions. And one story in particular, the children didn't necessarily recognize the word with the word jam meant. You know, they had heard the story a couple of times. When it came time to answer the question about what the story, what the word meant in the story, they had uh, different distractor answers. And so they chose every answer other than the one that the story meant, which was uh, jam, like jam that you would spread on um, bread. or So um, one of the things that we recognize, I work in the cafeteria every day for duty. Uh, our children eat jam, jelly, practically every other day, if not, <laughs> it seems like, because it's always sticky. And so, you know, I recruited the we, we had a discussion at data team's data team meeting and we all said, well, you know, we have jelly. Let's get everybody to refer to the jelly as jam. It's another it's another way to say jam because the kids don't normally hear those types of words. And so we recruited the cafeteria staff. We recruited the custodial staff because the custodians help us out in the cafeteria as well. And so we made a concerted effort to make sure that the kids knew what that word meant. And it's, it just doesn't stop with just jam. It um Anything that if we realize that, oh, the children are struggling with a particular thing, we try to get everybody on board to try to help the kids to make sure that they understand a particular, whatever the skill is. Um, if it could be addition, whatever. And I know we're talking about literacy, but we try to recruit everybody. We, we make sure to let them know we're all teaching the children, not just the teachers in the classroom, not just the parents. We all have some type of impact on the kids and let's just make it a positive one. And, um, and I wanted to go back to just like the 90 minute block and, and, and with us uh, having the paras uh, and, and everything, just like Jody said, we always had the interventionists, uh, they would always do study sessions with the paras to make sure and refreshers with the paras to make sure that they understood uh, what they needed to be working on. We would give them the data and explicitly explain what it is we needed them to do to help those children. And it has taken 
a different toll because previously we would have parents that just thought, well, I'm just here to assist the teacher. I'm not really supposed to be doing too much with the kids. And we had to change their mindset. Everybody that is in that classroom that is working with those children in any way, we consider you a teacher. We consider you an educator. And it has made a difference in, um, with our kids. And I, I feel like now our parents will stop me in the hall and say, hey, I recognize, you know, that child is struggling with this. And, you know, I'm going to, when we have wind time, I'm going to pull them to the side and I'm going to work with that. And so that has helped us out a lot. The culture of the building is we got to do whatever it takes to make sure these children are ready. And that's so evident if you if you ever go into Baines Lower. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a, a custodian say, remember, your, you have to stay on the perimeter of the hallway or, you know, just that use of rich language or um, vocabulary that's always present. And so and that really comes from Tanya and their instructional leadership team building that culture that every adult is a teacher. It Everyone is valuable and is bringing some value, some value to this. So um, Baines Elementary, I'll speak on their structure. Theirs looks very, very similar to Baines Lower, but it will um, sort of uh, disaggregate itself out a little bit more. So tier one is a 90 minute ELA. Uh, we do 90 minutes through fifth grade. So we teach with as much time in our literacy and numeracy with that as the focus. Um, we don't have as many, every classroom has another adult, whether it be a para, a special ed teacher, an interventionist at Baines Lower to push in. We don't have as many because we just have so many more classrooms. So every interventionist pushes in into a room that is of high need. And this is really built capacity across um, within the adults because we always look at it through the lens of students. So where what students are most in need, that's where we would push into the teacher. But as we've been hiring or seeing from the hiring pool, a lot more people who are coming to education from another career or through alternate certification or who maybe haven't had the background in actually teaching reading or things like that, we've realized that if we pair an interventionist who is very knowledgeable in this with maybe a novice teacher or a new teacher who doesn't have experience, we're building capacity within that teacher. So we, the, the principal and the leadership team considers a lot of things when they start saying, okay, I have this team of seven interventionists, which classrooms are we gonna, we're gonna be strategic about putting those teachers in. I will tell you this, um, one of the major culture changes that came about at Bain several years ago, um, and, and this happened when I was a principal there, there, it was sort of the model in an elementary school where we're these specialist teachers sort of created and turned their schedule into the office and said, hey, this is what I can and can't do. We sort of challenged that and flipped it on its head and said, no, we're going to build everyone's schedule because I've got to get the most for these students from every single person I have on this campus. And so we were finding, because we do not pull kids for intervention, we're, we're doing you a disservice if I'm taking you out of your tier one instruction. So we there are only certain times in the day that we can pull a kid. And we'll talk about that in our scheduling structure in just a few slides. But one thing that we made sure to focus on is all of that time that you can't pull a kid and serve in a small group setting, how do I leverage you still being in the building? And that's where we found this time during tier one, an interventionist is likely not pulling students, put them in the classroom. This has helped us in two main ways. One, like I already said, in building capacity in teachers to really learn how to teach the skill of reading. And number two, one of the big frustrations was how do we get students to bring the skill-based practice that they're getting an intervention with them and apply it and use it on a tier one in curriculum that's much more challenging. Well, the interventionist is actually present in the room. They're seeing firsthand the demand that is on students based on the standards and that tier one curriculum. And so they're the bridge. They're the bridge to remind that kid to push those students to apply and use that intervention skill that they're getting every single day 
to use it on that more complex text that they're being challenged with in the tier one curriculum. So that's what we say when we say a push-in model. Um, our tier two is much like win time at Baines. It's called prime time. It's an additional 40, 35 to 45 minutes a day. And this is a non-negotiable. So this is also kind of flipping an elementary schedule on its head. A lot of times elementary teachers write their schedule and they just make sure they carve out the time that they were told is the time your kids go to lunch, but the rest of the day is sort of up to them. Maybe, um, okay, I carve out time for my ancillary time and my lunch and the rest is up to me. Both Baines and Baines Lower have become very strategic about thinking like secondary people in terms of having a master schedule. So I can start piecing things in the day together and get the best use out of my people. I become, I be, I'm able to leverage the schedule to work for kids instead of to say, oh, well, I can only help six kids because that's the time of day it is. So we've really adopted at our elementary level that same sort of thinking that goes into middle school and high school in a master schedule model. So prime time or win time is built into the master schedule. It's non-negotiable. And as leaders, we're not in our offices during that time of the day, probably even more than when we're doing tier one instruction, we make sure we're present and in those classrooms so that there's that sense of accountability. It matters because I want to come see it. I'm going to be here with you doing it. And so it's something of meaning. So primetime win time is part of the master schedule. It's non-negotiable. Uh, the one thing a teacher does not ever feel like she has enough of, and it's true, is time. And so unless you build in a way to force them to sort of slam on the brakes, that becomes very hard for them to do. So this is a required time. Tier three intensive, and this is where our reading intervention is serve students in a prescriptive targeted intervention model. Um, we say no more than six kids. If my interventionist were on the panel here with you, they'd say it should be no more than four. I tell them all the time, if you had your way, you'd be one-on-one -on -one all day long. And we'd need about, you know, only 50 or 60 of you to get the job done. Um, we, we try to keep those groups no larger than six. But the magic in that is that the one rule we have for intensive intervention is you are not doing a mini reading lesson. That's what tier one is. The intensive intervention is absolutely targeting something that Dibbles or another screener has highlighted is a deficit. And we target, target, target. We progress monitor at least every two weeks. For some kids, we, we have the interventionist progress monitor weekly. And we track the growth in that. And then we believe that an intervention is truly supposed to be mobile. Um, this morning at eight o'clock, I was at an intervention meeting at Baines where they had had groups for three weeks. They had had two progress monitors and they were all meeting together with the principal to shift those groups. Who's out? Who needs to move to another target? Who made no growth? And we need to look even deeper. And so this is visited frequently. We don't you know why we don't change groups? And this is sometimes hard to say because that's that's inconvenient for the adults. That's hard. That's harder to schedule. And it's true. It is. But we have to make ourselves do that. OK, if you go to the next slide, I'll just quickly for the sake of information. Um, West Feliciana Middle has uh, all three tiers in literacy as well. They have 60 minutes for ELA and we do um, special ed instruction almost entirely through inclusion in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we have co-teaching both in uh, ELA and math classrooms. Their tier two is they have a time built in every day, um, time built in every day, 20 minutes, and they do high interest reading groups. It's called R2L. It stands for read to lead because it's also a leader in me school. So it's sort of their play on words. What we found through tons, trying tons of intervention programs and additional models and software licenses and all kinds of things, what we found in middle school is middle school is hard. Those kids are intellectually, there is a high demand on them. It is hard. They are reading and writing in every single course and it's hard. And the best thing we could give to them is something that we stopped doing way too soon. And we do high interest read alouds. 
And so they take the entire school body, sixth through eighth grade, they divide kids up based on their Lexile level so that they can be reading within their ZPD, not their grade level, but something that they can comprehend at the level they're at. And they read high interest books. The kids get to vote on the titles that they read and they do it in a variety of ways, but it usually includes the teacher doing a good old fashioned read aloud because we probably just quit reading out loud to kids way too soon. Right. So those kids are hearing every day, good fluency, good accuracy, um, and they're, they're getting the benefits of comprehension. And it's not for a grade. There's no high stakes attached to it. So the teacher just, um, just out of conversation will stop and ask probing questions and things like that, just honestly, because they're as into the books as the kids are. So that's our approach to tier two in middle school. And then we use Read 180 um, as a course in middle school. In our middle school, we use a seven period day. And this is the main reason we do it so that students who are assigned to Read 180 still have one other elective choice. So most students in the middle school who aren't in tier three for reading intervention, they can choose two electives, art, STEM, band, choir, you know, something along those lines. We do seven periods so that if we, the school, assign you to read 180, you still have one opening in your schedule and it doesn't feel as much like a punishment. Um, in high school, you can kind of see, listen, in high school, you're driven by credits and what courses give you credits. And so you can see um, we use block, we use a block scheduling model. We do a four day block. We have an odd day, even day and one day a week. They see all eight periods of the day. We also use Read 180 as a course at our high school level for those students most in need. They don't earn a credit out of it. So it is considered to be more like an elective, but um, there are mostly ninth graders, a few 10th graders who are still in there. You can go to the next slide. So what do we use? What are our materials? Um, so you can see prior to the, the Science of Reading Act uh, being passed or any of that law going into place, we used some special ed funding um, to have all of our teachers trained uh, with Orton-Gillingham strategies because we were seeing, even before COVID, we were noticing just very anecdotally, just a trend data, we're seeing a, high, a lot more dyslexia start popping up. Um, we're doing a lot of 504 meetings for characteristics of dyslexia. It was sort of ADD went away. And, well, it didn't go away, but you know what? Those, those were going down and now everybody had dyslexia. So we really kind of did some research and found that Orton Gillingham, while it's not a program, it focuses on a lot of the strategies that dyslexic programs are use as their foundation. So all of our teachers have had Orton, all of our teachers K through five And, spe and including special ed teachers have all had Orton Gillingham. We also selected as part of the science of reading uh, requirement, we went with letters. Um, and so we broke that up over the course of a year and a half. So we, our teachers are pretty much ending that right now. So letters is, is what we've used. Um, at Baines Lower, they previously used the Sunday system and uh, Sunday system fell out of a tier one rating by the state. So they moved away from it, but we kept, we say limited because there were still some good things that were specific needs, met the needs of kids. Um, but in tier one, every single student at Baines Lower uh, gets wit and wisdom in kindergarten. They get Frog Street in pre-K. Those are our tier one ELA curriculums, and they use Hegarty as their phonics focus or phonics specific curriculum. Um, we use Dibble's progress monitoring assessments, and we also use NWEA map assessments as an additional data point. Tanya, I'll let you go from there if you want to speak to specifics on curriculum for Bain Slower. Okay, and then also because uh, Kinder uh, did not get the letters training, I didn't want them to be left out of the loop with uh, the science of reading. So I had them get um, the Waterford science of reading training. So they had extensive training in that. And then also the keys to literacy training so that we would all be on the same page and, and aligned, you know, that they would know exactly what it is they needed to do in the classrooms as well. 
And then um, as far as the Sunday system, just like Jody said, although it's been knocked down to a tier three, it still has some very good stuff that has been effective with our uh, teachers and, and our students. It's uh, been proven to uh, help us out a lot. But in addition to that, we um, we because the teachers have gone through that Orton Gillingham training and the letters training, I can see a difference in the instruction and I can also see a difference in the results that the children, the children are actually learning and retaining. And then um, last year we recognized that our kids were uh, struggling with phonemic awareness. Like it was, it was really, really bad. And so we had to kind of take a step back and, and kind of figure out what, what we were gonna do to be able to address that. Um, so we used, we, we, we actually went in and dug deep into, we use Amplify for, uh, we had been giving uh, Dibbles testing through Amplify. And so it gives you prescriptive lessons to address particular things that the children are weak in. And so we pulled those lessons. We uh, started being a lot more intentional. We thought we were, we, we were doing everything we needed to do, but we recognized that we needed to pay a little bit more attention to that phonemic awareness. So we pulled those lessons from Amplify. We got going. And I, when I say we started maybe in the end of January and really like dug deep in February and started working it and tracking progress monitoring, we saw that our children were improving. And, and in addition to that, we went and we uh, did like a mock Dibbles test for pre-K to kind of see what those kids were going to, where they were and what they were going to look like coming into kindergarten. And we addressed that and gave those teachers different strategies that they could use. And we actually went back and dug deep into the training that the teachers had received from Keys to Literacy. And uh, from their uh, reading program at the time, they had OWL last year. And so we we just made minor adjustments and we did see some some differences the children actually improved and actually this this year the incoming kindergartners were the highest that we had in a while and so we're we're seeing we're kind of trucking along and making adjustments now we're recognizing that our area of, of weakness um, is decoding so we're we're hitting that real hard right now so we're just constantly looking at the data constantly tweaking some things addressing those areas of weakness and we're using a combination of all those things to do it along with everybody in the building all hands on deck yes <laughs> that should be our motto probably Tanya yes. <laughs> so yes. when you are when you work in a small uh, district and if those of you who are from a small system, you are going to so be able to relate to this, but you wear many, many hats because, uh, you know, my title to the school board is director of accountability and my job is curriculum instruction assessment and accountability. That's, you know, that's what runs through me. Tanya is an assistant principal and she's the early childhood guru for the entire parish. So, you know, we wear, we wear lots of hats. So I love that. Love rural districts. I, yes, yes. everyone pitches in, but that yes. really does create that belief that look, it everybody can play a part. And so we definitely tap into that. Um, Baines Elementary uses all the same things. Uh, in place of Hegarty, they use from phonics to reading, which is not a curriculum that has given itself to the state to even be tiered. It's authored by Wiley Blevins. Um, but the reason we went, they went phonics to reading, Baines lower focused on Hegarty because they were seeing in their data, they needed to really put a focus on phonemic awareness, which is a Hegarty is proven to do that piece excellently yeah. so yeah. they are exemplar at that and so we kind of said Baines Lower we need the foundation as solid as it can be and they've taken that as their job and they are they are rocking that we use from phonics to reading um, for first through third grade so we do carve out time and explicitly teach phonics all the way up through third grade. And we use from phonics to reading just because we found it kind of covered a little bit more wide breadth of phonics skills and those uh, foundational reading standards um, than, than Hegarty sort of targeted in on. And so that's our reason for going through the, through the two. Uh, we use Dibbles as our progress monitoring for students receiving tier three intervention. And then our teachers are able to at any time 
uh, get get a, an interventionist or an instructional coach and say, hey, I have a kid I'm worried about. And they'll find time in their day to go and do a quick progress monitor on those. So we will progress monitor monitor any kid is if they asked. But those that are getting a seat in tier three intervention are routinely, regularly progress monitored. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, just for continuity, I will tell you, Wesley Shannon Middle School uses Wit and Wisdom. Uh, we use HMH Read 180 and the special ed teachers through eighth grade were also given that Orton Gillingham training. At Wesley Shanna High School, we use HMH Into Literature as our ninth through 12th grade tier one curriculum. And they use HMH Read 180 um, and for a very small population. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Staffing. So how in the world do we do all these things we're saying? Well, the only way it can happen is it takes people. And I'm gonna tell you, um, going back, I moved into administration in this district eight years ago, and um, the I found myself year after year, I've had long conversations with my superintendent where I'm like, I'm not, I never come to you and I'm asking for furniture or that I need new desk. I never say, oh my God, we saw the coolest program at LeQ or, um, you know, on a, on a Facebook uh, group, what I'm always needing is people. Yeah. And because if you're truly going to have an impact it's not going to be programs. It's not going to be procedures or any of those things. Those are critical, but it's going to take a skilled staff. And so thankfully, I have always been able to work under leadership and, and our current superintendent, Hollis Milton, who really supports us in that. And so he will, he will often and has many times told me, I can't give you this, but I can give you this. So how can we make it work? I can't give you this. And we've gotten very, very creative to do to do what we've been able to do. So you're seeing what we offer uh, when you're looking at that list. Remember, Baines Lower is universal pre-K and kindergarten. And then Baines Elementary is uh, grades first through fifth. Um, now, I will tell you in transparency, um, Baines Lower is losing one of those reading interventionists to attrition because Esser is going away. And uh, Baines Elementary is losing one of those reading interventionist positions to attrition. So we are having to learn um, to, to maintain and continue to increase our results, maybe with even a few hands when we say all hands on deck, but because of the amount of people who were dedicated to this single focus, in the, the four years or five years, maybe wherever we're at since COVID, we caught back up. We caught back up and our data now looks like it did in years pre-COVID. So, mm -hmm. so we feel like any of the deficit that, that could have happened or did happen then, we dedicated, we put people in place to get put a person in front of a kid, not a computer program. We put a person in front of a kid and we're back to where we were before. And so now we've had three good solid years of being able to provide so much support that now we're able to keep going. I also just want to share this quickly to, to leaders who may be in this. Um, I noticed a trend as a principal every year I was going to my to my superintendent and saying, I need another special ed teacher. I need another special ed teacher. And, and he was noticing the same trend. Trust me. It was like, what is the deal? Like, are we just having so many more kids come who are sped or what is going on? And what finally occurred to me is I don't think we were addressing anything in a proactive way. We were only, we were not, we were, Nothing was being done until it was already a problem. And then kids were qualifying for SPED. And so I finally, I did some work. I spent a whole summer putting my data together, putting all my stuff together. And I went back to him and I said, I'm going to make you a promise that I will never again ask for another special ed teacher, but you have to start giving me more interventionist. Mm -hmm. um, for years, Baines worked with three reading interventionists. And they had no push-in model. Uh, when they weren't with pulling a group, they were in their rooms. Right. I'm not sure what they were doing, but they weren't yeah. with kids. Um, where there were a lot of legacy things that we had to change. But we found that once we started putting our focus on intervention and truly being proactive, and I worked at Bain, so seeing Bain's lower adopt that same philosophy and say, hey, 
we're going to we're going to get with these kids and provide intervention and provide support before they can they qualify for special ed services. I don't think we've add, added a special ed teacher, Tanya, since we've been back from COVID because we we've been able to be so proactive and get in front of problems and not not wait to address it until it already is a problem. And just speaking to that, Jody, um, because we know we are going to lose um, a reading interventionist, we have already taken steps to wean pre-K away from relying on having an interventionist because we won't we won't necessarily be able to provide them that particular um, luxury. I, I don't want to say luxury, but it is. Um, with the reading intervention is going and meeting with those kids. And so we, we've restructured that because we feel like if we can, early intervention is the key, but we feel like if we can um, meet the needs of those kindergartners that need us the most and get them to where they need to be because they'll be transferring and feeding into Baines, we, we would be doing the best job, but we don't just stop there because when the reading interventionists aren't working with kinder, we make sure to provide them some uh, training or PD time with the eight pre-K paras to help them to be strong and assist in the classrooms to help those kids. You know, everybody can't be everywhere all the time. And so we're trying to make the best use of the people that we have. And so we're 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 getting we're preparing them for the fact that you won't be able to have those two interventionists that you had in the past. You you'll have one or two or possibly three, they'll come and help out from time to time, but they won't be able to be there like they were in in the um in the past. And they and they have um become used to that and they um and I see the parents stepping up a whole lot more um and taking their their job seriously, you know, and we we don't want to put everything on their plates, but we do want them to know that hey, you are you have purpose in this thing and we we want to use you uh to help these kids. And so I, you know, I'm it's it's a beautiful thing to see them asking questions and, you know, hey, what do I do here? And I've recognized this. And so you know, although it's hurting our hearts that we're losing those people, it's helping us to kind of think yes. on our feet and, and come together to make sure that uh, we're not uh, losing anything, all the th the great things that we've gained. So you can go to the next slide. Um, West Feliciana Middle School and West Feliciana High School, you can kind of see their structure. Um, I don't know how applicable this is, our focus being um, elementary. Um, if you want to move to the next slide. So our MTSS process. So I very much appreciated Ms. Clark that that slide that she shared sort of RTI versus MTSS. And we've sort of started bleeding the lines between all of that. Um, and so it it's um, keeping a clear focus of what we're doing. And so we we have adopted an entire MTSS process. Um, and it looks very similar from pre-K, kinder, what Baines Lower does, all the way through. We've recently, uh, it's been added into our middle school for about three years, I guess now we're going on that. Now, I'm going to tell you this just straight out. This is hard to coordinate. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of the, a lot of times we don't do things because it's a, it's a convenience issue that would just be really hard to do. But we were determined. And, you know, a leadership team in a school, a group of educators who are determined, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, big force to be reckoned yeah. with. So I will tell you right now that this doesn't happen easily, but it absolutely can happen. So every one of these schools, uh, Baines Lower, Baines, and our middle school have what we call a SIT team. Um, they each may have a little different name or whatever, but basically we have a student intervention team. This happens before any kind of SBLC meeting happens. This is basically informal sit. So we don't necessarily invite a parent. We don't have to notify a parent that we're discussing their child. Um, what the process is, is that each school has, has identified a sit team leader. Um, at most schools, it's an instructional coach. Uh, I know that at our middle school, it's the one of the assistant principals does it. Um, and we build a team. And this team is every single time this team is present. Um, it's made up of, for we have a member from pupil appraisal. 
who is always present. We have a school administrator always present. We have an instructional coach always present. We have, uh, and we have either some form of speech, reading interventionist, um, someone who sort of works in the ancillary setting always present. So this is a team that is always there and it's an open, uh, kind of an open invitation where a teacher is given a process at the beginning of the year where it's nothing more than a brainstorming session. So a teacher may say, I have a student that I'm struggling with and I've tried every tool that I have in my tool teacher tool belt that we talk about and I don't know what to do. I can't figure this one out. They're, they're not growing or they're not making progress or we don't know what's going on. And so they submit a name to the person who coordinates. That person keeps a running calendar. At Baines and Baines Lower, these meetings happen once a week. Um, I know at Baines, this is every Friday morning. So the calendar is cleared because yeah. we know this is every Friday morning. At the middle school, it happens a little bit more spread out where you're not still identifying students with special needs as much by that age group. Um, so I think theirs may happen uh, every two weeks or every three weeks. I think they meet three times. We're on a nine week grading period. So I think theirs is every three weeks. Um, but all a teacher has to do is sign up and say, hey, I want a date to come to sit to talk about a kid. And we use uh, that person who, who's in charge of coordinating it will schedule that teacher and she coordinates with the Paris to go cover the class for that teacher, all, the, all of the people who teach that child to come to the meeting. We tell them you got to bring student work or maybe your concern is a behavioral concern bring a conduct chart. You may be bringing emails from the parent. Um, and the person who's the SIT team director, she has all the universal screener data. She has LEAP data if it's an older kid. And we lay it all out on the table. And it's just kind of a, okay, teacher, start, tell us what's going on. Well, this is what I'm seeing. These are all the things I've done. And that room of professionals who are coming from pupil appraisal and some are coming from speech therapy and a principal's coming from all the things the principal's dealing with. And we brainstorm and that teacher leaves with a plan. And sometimes the plan is, you know what? Everything that can be done has been done. We need to move forward and probably need to talk to the parents about a possible eval, or we need to talk to the parents about a possible 504 plan. But often more times than not, we're able to come up with some suggestions or ideas. And thankfully, we've done this process for so long, the teachers come open-minded and we say, hey, let's try this. And we always put a timeline on it. Let's try this for three weeks. Let's try this for four weeks. And then we're going to reconvene and we're going to look and see, did we get anywhere? This is also a necessary part of the evaluation process, because I'm sure as we have all experienced, when you begin going through the pupil appraisal process or you're wanting to seek out a student, um, whether for a 504 or a, an IEP, you've got to bring the data that you have you have tried everything um, first. So we take that very seriously because we want to avoid an evaluation at all cost, but if it just can't be avoided, we already have the data to turn right over to people appraisal and people appraisal can pick it up and run with it from there. Oh, and by the way, because a people appraisal person has been in every one of those meetings, they know right where they're picking it up from. But the beauty of it is more often than not, we're able to say, hey, this is the plan. These are our next steps. As a school leader, it's it's putting kids in front of me that I need to, to be aware of, that I need to sort of keep an eye on. Um, sometimes it's a, we need to have a parent conference that includes a school leader. Sometimes it's we're going to, I think if we just give a little bit more here or there, we may call a, a, a reading interventionist may say, hey, you know what, I'm going to, um, I'm going to take, I'm going to leave a push in class 30 minutes early for two weeks, and I'm going to go provide some one on one support. And let's just see, let's just see if reading intervention is going to be the thing before we give them a seat. We will try so many different things, but it's nothing more than a brainstorming session. It happens weekly, and the biggest the biggest struggle with it is making sure those people's calendars stay clear. And number two, you're having to provide some class coverage because it's meaningless if it doesn't include those teachers. They're the ones who are bringing the most knowledge about that student. Um, we can do up to about, well, 
at towards this time of year, when we're really getting to know kids, we'll have anywhere, we'll meet around anywhere for three to four kids. And we try to make sure we do it all within about a 30 minute um, time period so that we can, we can get in and out and, and move on. And a lot of times we find it's a teacher who's just going, oh my gosh, I've never even thought of that. Like my head is, my head is spinning. I've tried everything I know. That's something I can do. Let's try that for a little while. Um, so this is our MTSS process. This happens happens weekly. This happens before an SBLC ever comes into play. Um, it is our RTI data collection process if we are move if we have to move forward um, in anything like that. But it's done wonders in us being targeted and specific. When we talk about kids, we talk kid by kid. Uh, we talk one at a time. Um, from year to year, we have meetings with each grade level all the way through seven, uh, through fifth and sixth grade. And we meet our, we bring all our special ed teachers of those grade levels together and kindergarten tells the first grade sped teachers kid by kid. This is who's coming. This is the growth we've made. These are the challenges we still uh, think you're going to face. This is what we think their best placement would be. That's decided on a kid by kid um, factor. How do we do this? We've gone as far as having Zoom meetings where, you know, we'll pull a pair to cover a class, but we try to all get in the room together. We schedule them on one day and it starts kindergarten to first grade from 8.30 to 9.30, first to second, second to third. And we talk all the way to fifth grade talks to the sixth grade teachers because that's a big campus jump. That's for, for our kids in our district. That's when kids leave a building. Um, so that is... That's sort of our intervention structure, our process um, in a nutshell. There were a couple of questions I saw in the chat. Uh, it was asked, what computer or software programs do we use? Um, Tanya's mentioned Waterford. We do use Waterford for reading. Um, we use Moby Max loosely. We really, really, really try to come from a place of we want it to be teacher led. Uh, I will tell you this in fourth and fifth grade, well, fourth through ninth grade, we use Read 180 because it has a teacher component. We've adopted nothing that is 100% computer based. We, If it doesn't have a teacher component, we're a little leery of it because we know it's going to take the work of that teacher and that student. Um, but we do use Moby Max. We use Waterford. Um, we have we have licenses to to all of those things. We will use Read 180, just the software piece for some kids who maybe have some deficits, but they're not low enough to get a seat in full intervention. We'll just give them access to the software. Um, so those are those are our main subscription uh, based ones that we use. Uh, we have some teachers in Tier One who will use things um, everything from uh, Freckle to um, we'll have some who use um, Epic for uh, book reading, um, a lot of kind of just personal things that they will use, but our, our kind of district-wide ones are Waterford and Moby Max. Mm -hmm. um, I know several people have asked about our schedules. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you are able to pull up. So I emailed you a, um, a snapshot of, of sort of what our schedule looks like. I don't know if you were able to open that, but if you are able to share that screen, um, I would be happy to show that with uh, with the different people. Just a second to um, pull up my email. I was going to yes, send it afterwards, but if you'll give me one oh, minute. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, no, 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 that's, no, no. You're fine. You're absolutely fine. I just need okay. to- I just know several people have asked about it and, and I sure don't mind kind of just talking through it. Absolutely. Give me one second. You can never get the one screen you need out of the way. I understand. Um, <laughs> while, while Jennifer is doing that, I'll jump in before we go to the next um, section and say that um, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but you definitely had me at Orton Gillingham. So kudos <laughs> to you guys for having the foresight to, um, to include that. We got the schedule up. All right. Awesome. So if you will focus on that column all the way to the left, though, that's each grade level breakdown. Um, yeah. So if you want to enlarge the screen, if you're able to do that and just that column down the left, um, the left hand side, um, 
the toughest part is having the structures in place to hit it at tier one. Absolutely. So that's from Susan. If you're, we can focus on intervention all day long, but you're absolutely right. If tier one instruction is lacking, then you're never going to really hit the dial, no matter how good your intervention is. And that was one of our main motivations for leveraging interventionist in push-in. So they probably have as many hours of a day spent in a general ed tier one classroom, providing co-teaching or supporting a single or group of kids as they are in small group instruction so that we can build that capacity across all of our teachers. And it's not something that just the interventionists have, that they're the, the kind of the, the holders of all that knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look across that left column, this going down, this is these are some tweaks that we're making um, in place for uh, the coming school year. First grade, um, so you can see the way we do uh, first grade. So what are we doing with science and social studies, right? This is the early childhood conundrum. We have a very intense set of standards now, um, but we know we have to provide good reading, literacy and numeracy instruction. So what we did is, and this is, this may be controversial for some, what we've done across the board, first through fifth grade, is we've sort of broken out of the mold of a homeroom setting. Um, and so what we've done is we've paired up two teachers. So a child, even as young as first grade, will have two core teachers. So I have a teacher who does my ELA and my social studies, and I have a teacher who does my math and my science. This was truly a request of the teachers and we pro con this to death and we all accepted that a huge con of this is time with the kids. You have more kids. It may be a little harder to build relationships with the students, but what the teachers noted is even more, it's hard to build relationship with their parents because you're doubling the number of parents as well. But they felt like with new standards being sent out and a new, a renewed focus on um, the, the components of reading and good reading instruction, they said, we feel like we're, we're adequate at all four things. But if I could have a focus, then I could really attack my two set of standards with a with a newfound kind of, we can get to some rigor here. And so that was our, that pro weighed heavier at where we were um, in schooling than the others did. So you see ELA math number one, ELA math number two, that's two teachers paired up. They each teach their class ELA and math, and then they switch and they teach ELA and math again. Um, every single grade level has ancillary where every kid goes at the same time. That takes people because I got seven homeroom classes. I got to have places for seven classes to go. But that is protected non-negotiable time because I can't give you common planning if I don't have every kid leaving at the same time. And we are very much a PLC built school. And what we do in PLCs is the stuff that we've been talking about all of this. Who's in intervention? Who am I targeting? Who is? It's all through the lens of data. So we use student work and data to plan, to collaborate, no teacher in our buildings does anything alone. No teacher does anything alone. They all come to the center of their schoolhouses and that's where that work is done for that 60 minutes. Um, then you see prime time number one or science or social studies for 50 minutes. So this is a little bit different too. Um, kind of, we're, we're very much taking a secondary approach and sort of applying it to elementary and can they handle it? And for the most part, they've been able to. So. Um, you either are getting that prime time time where we talked about that's the that's the hard break where we're not teaching any we're not continuing to teach new information but we're providing additional time and support for standards that you need or you're seeing a tier three uh, reading interventionist uh, and and you're going back you're getting a targeted skill we have to do it then though because you're never going to be pulled out of math ELA science or social studies 
And for the most part, you're not going to be pulled out of an ancillary either. It says it's a separate time that's built into the day. Phonics, we have a phonics time and you see we're dedicating almost an hour to that a day because we're uh, we're including our interventionist in that. And then if I had prime time in that first red block, I switch to science or social studies in the bottom one or vice versa. So why does it say science or social studies? Because we departmentalize it. So one day I have science, the next day I have social studies and we go back and forth. Um, how do a six-year-old keep up with that? Isn't that confusing? Isn't that what we had done in the past, back in the days when we had social living, uh, we did all of one science or social studies in semester one, and then we did semester two. And with the new social studies standards, and with the standards being so heavily dependent on the grade level prior doing its job, we knew we couldn't just kind of say, okay, whatever, whatever, we're going to keep doing this. But we have found giving 50 minutes every other day, we're able to cover, we, we've been able to manage and get the bulk of those standards taught both in science and social studies. And the kids do fine. <laughs> well, they've been great with the uh, with flipping it and, you know, how do they do on tests or, you know, they went to science, how can they come and skip a whole day and take a social studies test? Because those teachers are super intentional about review, about practice, about making sure they're appropriate. Um, so then you can see second grade, they start their day with phonics for everyone. Well, why does one first grade do it at 120 and second grade's doing it at eight o'clock? That's what I mean when I start talking about of the, the instructional leaders building a master schedule. So I've put those phonics times, we've plugged them into the day where every interventionist is available. So I have five additional reading interventionists who could be available from eight to 8.45 to go, to go completely cover second grade. From 1.20 to 2.15, I have five interventionists available to completely cover first grade. So it's building that putting those things that affect the whole school down first and then with the time that's left going back in and working in and out um working in the other core subjects uh you see an ELA math 1 and 1 and 2 uh so again they're paired up so i each student has two teachers they have one that does math science one that does uh ELA and social studies also let me point out that phonics time being separate Every single teacher does phonics because we we are not letting the math science people who say, I love Eureka math, let me live in math. Everyone needs to know that science of reading because you can provide as much good literacy instruction in application in science and social studies if you're part of knowing what those kids are being taught. I am in science and social studies classrooms in kindergarten through third grade Every single day where I see a math teacher have a kid who struggles with a word in a word problem, or they're reading an experiment in science, and they immediately, without even thinking, they're going into their strategies. They're scoop the word, decode, because they're also the ones teaching it. Um, what, uh, something that we very much push in Wesley Shana Parish, every teacher is a literacy teacher. We are even trying to convince our high school people of that. And that's a harder sell, but every teacher is a literacy teacher because if every single thing we do in school requires that skill set be strong. Um, I think that Jennifer is going to share this out to you. So I will really kind of leave it more with questions um, rather than walking through every one of them. The last one I can do is third grade. Uh, you can see, and if you also notice that that dedicated phonics time it starts becoming tiered less. So in first grade, it's 55 full minutes. In second grade, it's 45 full minutes. By the time we roll into third grade, it's 35 minutes. So if we've been doing our job all along and building those solid foundations, then we should start being able to see uh, that kind of taper off um, and, and move away as, as we go. Um, they You see that prime time? That's 60 minutes, and that's where they use the reading interventionist as well. So they have from 930 to 1015. No one should really be needed in first grade. No one's really needed in second grade. They can all dedicate their time to supporting those kids in third grade. 
So uh, that, that's how we break it, break it up and are able to still hit all of our minutes, do all of our things. And then we are very, very intentional in science or social studies because they're also teaching phonics. And so we are heavy literacy focused, even in science. We are talking about disciplinary literacy. We're talking about the literacy, the reading that it takes to read a graph, the reading that's required to read a word problem. Um, we that is that is infused into a student's entire day. So Jennifer, I will now say that's sort of all for me. I don't know if Tanya wants to add anything. But if not, I'll turn the program back over to y'all um, to decide, you know, wherever we go next. No, the only thing I would say is um, the benefit for us with Waterford um, is uh, we do use it uh, during wind time. But uh, for us, um, the reason why it's so important for us is we can assign children playlists and it's specific to whatever it is that... Um, they're uh, struggling with. So it's not just some uh, program that, you know, they're just, it's, it's not, it's meant to be fun, but it's also, um, it's structured and, it, and it's based off of that data. So if they're struggling on a particular uh, skill, the teacher can go in and say, okay, well, they need to focus more on um, beginning sounds. So let me just put these in their playlist and that's what they would work on. And if they don't necessarily uh, get that, then it's going to reteach it to them and then give them an opportunity for success. Thank you. All right, guys, we've got about a three minute video um, and we're going to watch the third grade intervention, the push-in model so that you get some more ideas about what that looks like. The other three, other two videos are also in your handout. Um, I've given the tiny URL um, directives there so that you can find it. And hold on, I've got to figure out how to get this to the right screen because, of course, it didn't pop up where it was supposed to. All right, let's see if we can make this work. Right. Who can raise their hand? Yesterday we started a new unit um, for phonics. What was our skill that we started talking about yesterday? And okay, he said close vowels and open vowels. You're on the right track. Can somebody add on to that, Bailey? We did do some spelling practice, but that was not our skill. Ian said a word, open and close. That's kind of jogging my brain. LaPatrick? Okay, what do we mean by open and close vowels, Albert? We were sorting them out. The we, closed six syllables from yesterday. Very good. We were sorting those closed syllables. And what does that mean when we say closed syllable? How do we know that it's a closed syllable, Braylon? Well, it's like a letter. It's not a letter. It's 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 a and Connor said that it's going to be a consonant behind it and then one in the front. Remember, it's kind of like the gate that closes, okay? So we talked about open before. Yesterday, we were focusing on close, and Albert reminded us that we sorted those syllable parts by our closed sound. All right, today we're going to read a text that's going to have some of those closed syllable sounds. Can somebody give me an example of a closed syllable? So that's going to be a vowel that's closed behind a consonant. Right, can you give me an example of that? Very good, Pat, another example, Bailey. Cow, cow, okay. And it would, would cow have, his cow doesn't have, look at the vowel. That was a tricky word because remember we're looking for that short vowel sound. Oh, 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 oh. 
Do you want to speak to that, Jody? Yes. So, um, so really, what I wanted to highlight was, I'm sure you were able to figure this out, but um, the young lady in the white sweater, she's the classroom teacher, and she's actually newer to instruction. Her, this is her first year in third grade. She comes from upper grade levels where you don't really break all of that down. And the lady in the purple shirt, she's our reading interventionist. And so she's a former second grade teacher and she has spent years now focused solely on reading intervention. But the fact that they're in that room together and they've established that rapport with each other, I don't know if you could catch it, but she sort of, her eyes, the, the teacher just kind of could scan and you saw Miss Pullman just go right in. And then she had the knowledge and the background to be able to go and take it from there. And now as it just, seamlessly released back to the to the regular ed teacher who has the lesson plan and knows the goals for that day miss pullman now goes table to table or with specific kids in mind and she's going to provide additional support and redirection and whatnot but those questions or a kid who went well what about hillside yeah. or you know throwing that out that could be lost or it's a missed opportunity but using that push-in model, that's what we're able to uh, to really leverage so much. And Ms. Pullman, just by being present in the room and, and giving her knowledge out, she's building the capacity for, for that other teacher who this kind of content is just new to. What a great way to um, build capacity. All right, so let me get this screen out of the way. All right, so... Dijanae needed to leave. And so she asked me to do a couple of little recaps. She really wanted to stress um, the idea of people over programs. Y'all have done a really great job of really looking at the people and how best you can use them as opposed to just relaying on a on a on a program that may or may not work, or in some cases require even more people to run that program. Right. Um and a good job of thinking about those sustainabilities for when ESSER runs out. Yes. Um, 
I'm on a school board. I know that's something that we address at every meeting. How are we going to maintain what we have without losing the integrity of everything that we've worked for over the last couple of years? So that's that's a big thing. Um, and then the importance of, of SBLC and the MTSS process. And you guys even gone one step further. As y'all were talking about your SIT committees, when I first started teaching, um, I worked for a phenomenal um, principal. And that was one of the things that she did every SBLC meeting was just like, who do we have questions about? Who's really yes. struggling with the kid? Come on in and talk to us and let, let's put our heads together and figure out. And we were super successful with students. Um, and I, I, I really believe that that was part of the reason why we were just so focused on what can we do to get them um, that support before the fact. So we really thank y'all. Um, is there are there any other questions that you that anyone has? Last minute questions. I don't see anything in the in the Q and A. I will be sending out um, the link for uh, the video, and in it we'll put the the link for the schedules. I did post the link to the schedule. I was able to get it um, posted. So if you want to take a look at them now, they'll be there. Um, there will be a quick survey at the end once this is closed out. Please take a minute to answer it because it really does inform what we do um, and what we bring to you guys, okay? So please take a moment to do that. Thank you, Jody and Tanya, for coming out and joining us and bringing us this great information. I'm really excited about seeing what everyone else does in our state and how successful they are. Absolutely. Thank y'all for having us. It was yeah. truly our pleasure. Thank y'all. Right. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you so much.